Hey, how are you guys doing? My name is Kevin Devani, the host of the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. Bitcoin, you know, is the monetary evolution and, you know, fiat money in whatever shape or form has always failed. It's always, a, always been a miserable, catastrophic, pain causing experiment that's been going on for such a long time. So without further ado, I want to announce my next special talk with Emil Sunstedt. Econo Alchemist and Mick. I'm going to put their uh, sites, their websites on the show notes. Please give it a like, retweet, share, subscribe, please, to my YouTube channel, my podcast platforms. It's going to be an awesome talk. We're going to go really down the rabbit hole, especially about the history of money, fiat money, uh, you know, the current situation evolving with central bank digital currencies, the surveillance panopticon, uh, fascist, ty tyrannical, you know, governmental shit that's going on. So a lot of topics to talk about. Thanks so much again for your support, for listening. And don't forget to subscribe. Without further ado, here's my talk with Emil, Mick, and Econa Alchemist. All right, welcome to the show. My name is Kevin Davani. My very special guest is Emil Stansted, uh, who I've already had on my show a couple of times, a few times actually. Uh, then we have um, Econo Alchemist and Mick. So how are you guys doing? Thanks so much for your time coming to my show. How is everything? Good. I'm Thanks good for having me on. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for this opportunity. All right. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Um, listen, guys, I mean, I've been trying to, like, to, uh, I, I brainstorm a little bit, like, what could be, like, a common denominator, what we could talk about, like, especially when I look at all your, you know, amazing content you throw out on Twitter or on your blogs, what have you, like, uh, email uh, with your website, bdratings.org, and then we have uh, Burn the Bridge, that's, or Economy Alchemist with his Twitter handle, um, with his, you know, amazing articles on, I just uh, read the latest one, uh, to be honest with you, um, especially the one with intrusive surveillance is, uh, what's the title? I think intrusive surveillance, something like that, yeah. Oh, it, yeah, intrusive surveillance is someone's full-time job. Exactly, yeah. And then we have uh, MetaMic14, or Mick, I'm gonna call him Mick, um, with his, um, yeah, you got a uh, very interesting site. It's called Money Mail. Maybe we want to talk about that. So, uh, Mick and uh, Econo Alchemist, would you like the two of you, because Emil already, you know, been on my show, so most of my listeners know him. Um, could you, like, introduce yourself a little bit? And, you know, what is Bitcoin to you? Why are you in Bitcoin? <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, so, I got started with Bitcoin in late 2018. Uh, it was Christmas Day, and my brother-in-law was into cryptocurrencies. And so I started asking him about Bitcoin, and that started me uh, down the path of uh, learning about Bitcoin. And the more I learned about it, uh, the more I started realizing how important self-custody and privacy and being able to use Bitcoin in a way uh, that is censorship resistant. And initially I was interested in Bitcoin because of the upside potential to make money. Uh, but the more I learned about it, the more that became less important and the other properties of Bitcoin became more important to me. And so now, you know, fast forward a couple of years, um, I'm trying to learn as much as I can still and trying to take what I learn and put it out there in uh, the form of my blog or Twitter content. I do a lot of threads on Twitter about how to use Bitcoin in a way that uh, you are taking self-custody of it and um, using Whirlpool and interacting with it privately. Um, so now I just try and share ideas that get people thinking uh, about the importance of self-custody and censorship resistance. 
Fascinating. Yeah, I love your stuff, man. So, Mick, um, you're also, you are, um, I think um, I read something on your Twitter handle that you are also a UX designer. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I'm actually a user researcher, uh, but I have a, a mixed background in economics and anthropology. So, uh, I did a BA in both. Um, and sort of uh, my my interest and my, my, my sort of passion has always been really in understanding behavior and, and kind of trying to get to people's uh, behaviors and way of thinking, belief systems, uh, and so forth. Um, and my take has always been to do so from, I guess, different different ways of doing that. And I would go in economics class and they would teach you that humans are, are rational. And then I go to, to, and they would tell you progress is good. And then you go to anthropology course and they will tell you humans are not, are not so rational although economics has definitely changed since, since then but it, exposed to very very different uh methods and and ways of uh ways of thinking different epistemologies um and but it's sort of I'm a, i've been applying these ways of thinking and these uh, these uh, uh academic approaches in the realm of technology so i'm working a lot as a, as a user researcher, as a consultant for startups, uh, but also uh, uh, more sort of uh, fintech labs uh, and so forth. Um, and I'm happy to, to talk about Money Mill um, if, if the chance comes up, but in terms of to answer for your question, when did I sort of get interested in, in Bitcoin? I think it was in 2010 that I was, I was first exposed to Bitcoin. I was told by all these friends that this was sort of you know, this virtual currency that you could just buy and people, you know, some friends of mine would use it to, to buy drugs, uh, uh, not, uh, um, not for anything else at the moment. But, but, but I remember really clearly them saying, hey, how about we buy some and who knows what's going to happen? And we're saying, what is this, this BS, uh, this virtual money? And I think at the point I had this idea that Bitcoin was just virtual, like as in virtual and, um, you know, could be made up, right? Um, and then I got exposed to it again, sort of from time to time, but I really didn't quite understand the, the implications of it until 2017, when I realized that it was a 2000. And <clears throat> I started paying attention to it and reading more about it and understanding the fundamental <laughs> technological mechanisms which it work, the fact that it's incontrollable that nobody no single central authority can control it the decentralization element for sure spoke to me because what happens when in a world in which money a, a decentralized form of money cannot be destroyed right um and we've seen this again uh you know we see people still keep on trying to to think okay governments will ban it or you know people who don't have a grasp of it will, will say to you uh, you know, it will it will be it will be turned off. This is the problem. The genie is out of the bottle. It's like now it's the question: How is the world going to react to Bitcoin now that it's alive, now that it's well, now that it's strong? So to me, it's all it's you know, and sort of thinking about the economics in a macro perspective. It's like how does the world with a world that exists with Bitcoin responds to its own exi its own existence? Um, and so it's sort of led me down the rabbit hole. Uh, there's so much amazing content out there that you cannot but be led down the the, the, the uh, sort of the areas of, of economics, down finance, and then looking at the, the current uh, economic system. You know that 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 is uh, yeah that it is what it is, uh, and so yeah. So it's been uh, ever since uh, going deeper and deeper. Fascinating. Thanks for sharing. Uh, so, Emil, uh, you know, I mean, we've been having so many discussions also either one-on-one -on -one with you or with Stephanie von Jan, you know, the economist from Germany. Mm. Um, and I took, you know, I just, I bring somebody like a working title for our episode and I wrote, you know, like on for the thumbnail, I'm like, okay, let's talk about like fiat money, you know, like, is this, why is this like being a continuous failed, uh, you know, fucked up experiment, over, you know, for more than hundreds and hundreds of years. And why are we not learning from history? And, you know, and is Bitcoin, you know, finally, at last, you know, the monetary evolution we've been waiting for, the cat is out of the bag, as, you know, Mick also said, and the genie is out of the bottle. So what are we waiting for? Yeah, the Bitcoin part is still uh, speculative and we are all hoping and, and working for the best. But uh, as to your first question, is that can't we learn from history? 
this is actually a question that I see when I study monetary history as well. And people ask this question hundreds, uh, 100 years ago and 200 years ago. They ask, do we not learn from history? So that kind of, kind of proves that we don't really learn from history. Because uh, um, when, when countries embark on these monetary experiments, they always try to rationalize uh, when past failure occurred. Um, I have I have two examples uh, in France. This actually my my two favorite examples are the French experiment by John Law in uh, beginning of 18th century uh, and the Assignat experiment 80 years later, so also in the 18th century. And it's kind of curious because during the second experiment, when they knew that the first experiment had completely failed, they rationalized it by, in this case, the first experiment was conducted when France was an absolute monarchy. That means uh, you have a really powerful guy in power. So eight years later, when they saw the first monetary experiment fail, they rationalized it by saying that, yeah, but it was, uh, it was this powerful central authority that printed too much money. Now we are a constitutional republic. So now we, it's in the interest of the people as a collective to not wreck the money, right? Um, so every time, these fiat money experiments, they come wrapped in new kind of um, apologies for the past uh, failures. Um, and we, we have seen it time and time again. Uh, so no, I don't think we will really learn from, from history. I think we will continue to repeat. Um, but the, the more these things are repeated, the more people actually can, can, uh, can learn from them, I guess. Um, and I can actually pivot to because I, I'm, I'm writing a book right now about these uh, early paper money experiments. Is that your second book? It's my second book, yeah. Yes. So it's a, it's a second uh, money dethroned. So I wrote, uh, I have the first book here. It's called uh, Money Dethroned, a Historical Journey. It deals with uh, primitive monies Great and book. metallic monies. Uh, so it's kind of this early evolution of money. Um, the second book deals with early paper money experiments. Uh, and my, the, the thing I want to point out by showing these different uh, failures of, of past paper money experiments, or fiat money, it's not, it's not to wallow in, in you know, failure and laugh at, at countries that fail. It's because we, we can infer from these experiences, and we can draw conclusions based on them and, and apply it today when we analyze Bitcoin and when we analyze uh, the current system. So do you think uh, we are at like, uh, well, what do you guys think? Are we, are we at like, like a super critical juncture of, of, of uh, you know, monetary history where all these, you know, the concentrated uh, sick diseases come to the surface, you know, the symptoms with negative rates and everything else, you know, with whatever uh, has to do with, you know, connected, connected to state, to government, to surveillance, to, uh, I mean, everything around us is that like a culmination is that or what do you guys think i think to answer that um and i think maybe to it's a way to also to pick it up with what emil, emil was saying uh with the question of of inevitability is is money perhaps something that is tied to the overall structure of an of a civilization and emil was reading through some chapters of your book in, in the roman empire and one cannot wonder whether, you know, the, it is. It is. I mean, on one hand, uh, money is 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 a I, the civilization depends on money, right, for its own functioning, uh, and you know, and by that I mean money that is um, hard, that hard money, money that is um, backed by real substantive um, thing, not 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 money that is diluted that leads for to, um, to uh, lack of price discovery and so forth. But could it be that you actually, that, that, it, that it's actually the, the other way around, right? So it's not a civilization needs money, but also that it's the, the, the turmoil and the challenges that, that, it, that the civilization is undergoing leads the civilization uh, to, to dilute it because of its 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 uh, its constraints and, and limitations. 
Yeah, definitely. Money is, uh, as you indicated, money is the glue that keeps division of labor together. It's uh, completely necessary for civilization to function. Money, money is fundamental for people to be able to specialize. We specialize, we produce what we are good at, and then we trade through money. So this is why, so money is in the middle of the whole of this. So this is why it's so important that when, when these uh, central banks and governments start to mess with the money and they start to hammer away on the money, that, that, that is hammering away on the thing we, we use to stave off starvation. Uh, division of labor is extremely important. And if division of labor falls, the producer of food cannot trade with the consumer of food. So it's, ex it's an extremely serious issue. Uh, and it seems that if we infer from history, many civilizations have embarked on actually seizing on the money. It's usually when they already are in trouble, like they have already taxed the population, uh, what they can do, all, all the you know, proper taxes are in place. They have already taken up enough debt so that people don't want to lend more money to them for good interest rate. So it's one of the last things that they, they can do to seize on the money to produce money um, for low cost and, and to spend it for uh, its full value. So, yeah, it's in, a, in, it's in a way inevitable if they can seize money. And with Bitcoin, of course, it's much, much harder to seize on Bitcoin. It's extremely hard, I would say. So it's, it's definitely a, a large improvement. To, to, me, to me, what this means, though, is that who has to learn here is not so much the civilization, the, the, the leaders of civilization, like the central banks, it's more the people have to re realize that they have this tool and, that can enable all their time, effort and work to not be diluted away. To me, this is possibly one interesting conclusion is that it's, it, it is us, it is the people um, and that central banks to some extent, you know, not, 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 you know, they're doing what they can with the tools they have. And I think I really do believe that a lot of these people do have good intentions behind their action. They really do think that printing will, will help. And it actually will help in the short run, right? But this is more of a medium to, I mean, to now we're probably more in the, in the shorter <laughs> run. But uh, the dilution of money is, is more of a, okay, we will, it's kind of kicking the can down the road a bit, isn't it? Yeah. Mick, can, can I ask you a question? Because you, you have studied the German experiment, the experiment, right? The inflation. I haven't studied that period. So when I, I saw that you tweeted about this event, and I wondered when the hyperinflation there kicked in, do you have any, do you have any feeling for how, what the German central bank were uh, thinking? Like, That's such a good did question. They, did they know that they were wrecking the money or was it just general confusion? That's a great question. And, and the book keeps on, on saying this, which, I mean, I would like to challenge to some extent, and I would love to go more in depth, really understand if there was more sinister uh, under uh, beliefs, but they really didn't associate money printing to, <clears throat> to, the, to the dilution of money. They saw money printing as the consequence of... of of uh, inflation, not the cause, which is yeah, bizarre. Yeah, this is very interesting. It's, it's, it's very interesting because when I read these experiences from France, for example, there is one effect that I want to want to talk to you about, and it's uh, it's quotations from the past that people feel like there is a sudden shortage of money. Meanwhile, the the the, the central bank is mass producing money. So it's a kind of paradox, right? Yes, exactly. So, so the more the central bank is printing, the more references we can see that people are complaining that there's a shortage of money. Hmm. And this is, uh, when I notice this, I mean, it, it's very important to understand the dynamics, I think. It's because, really similar. Yeah, you're, you're yeah, spot on. To me, it's kind of a point for hyperinflation, that when the money that you add to the system is worth, if you add 10% of the money supply, for example, but the total value of all the money in society decreases by around 20% because uh, people, prices are always forward-looking in, in, in a free market. So the, the value of money is always forward-looking. 
So that means that the new production chase, it chases fewer and fewer goods and services. So people's savings can't keep up with prices. Uh, and the more money is printing, the more people will feel like there's a scarcity of money. So this is extremely dangerous, I think, when this feeling sets in among the population. Absolutely. Yeah, you see the same, the same mentions of shortage of, of money. And it's quite perplexing, right? Because it, it, it assumes that money, that it's a question of, of what, what, you know, in this discussion, where is the economy? Where is productivity? Uh, this is totally out of the question because in this system, you have exorbitant, in, uh, exorbitant unemployment uh, at, at one of the, the heights of the, of the of, of, well, the entire German experiment was, was well, Germany was, was taken over by, uh, by, by France, the entire rural region, the most productive region in Germany. 80% um, of the coal mines, 70% of the iron ore, the most industrious region in Germany was taken over by France for a period of years. The entire population was put on subsidies and, and, and support system. This, this is millions of people, I think, I believe, around two, two million people just in the rural region out of six million in total, something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, uh, um, that led to, so there was a, a lot of unemployment, a lot of people demanding, like we are now to, to some extent on furlough, demanding money, the, the money you're giving me is not enough, right? And that discussion of the money not being enough happens when it's the government providing the substances and, and because the economy is somewhat in a struggle, in a, in a, in a, in dire straits. Yeah, and just to add quickly, I think that uh, this dynamic that we talked about is that there's a flat shortage of money when there really isn't. There's an abundance of money. Uh, I think this, these are the reports that we banks from all from uh, all different sources that there is a shortage of money. So they get these conflicting reports. They see that they are mass printing, and meanwhile they get reports and they get pressured by politicians that there is a shortage of money. So it's kind of understandable that some nations end up in these heaps of paper money in the streets. It's not 100% nefarious uh, policy. It's an effect of confusion and just stupidity. And also, somewhat, it's a policy that is very actually listens to people's demands. Uh, that okay, people really feel in that way. Let's print more money and, and solve the problem. I, I got that sense also from the German uh, case that. It, it was, it, you know, it was almost uh, socialist-leaning policies um, that, you know, that led to a lot of this, uh, you know, yeah, let's let's support the people so that they don't revolt, so that they don't burn our houses um, and don't burn the streets. But that has consequences. So I think this is, I think this is, you know, I think looking into the mechanics helps you appreciate that what's happening is not uh, necessarily an evil system or. A nefarious, uh, nefarious one, but it's just a lot of misunderstanding about the nature of, of the economy. It's a lot of um, short-termism of kind of helping people today without understanding the consequences that money printing has uh, later on. Um, let, let's let's maybe extrapolate this to the current situation right now with the. Uh, you know, this whole uh, topic about central bank digital currencies, Lagarde propagating or pushing this uh, digital euro, uh, because the monetary system is based on debt, right? I mean, I think we agree on that. Uh, is the plan to somehow eliminate the commercial banks, the banks out of the equation and put like the central bank digital currencies, uh, like, and then, what happens? I mean, is that going to be like a deflationary shock? And then uh, we would go into inflation, hyperinflation, or where do you, uh, where would you see this going or evolve? Well, personally, I have, I have no clue, actually. It, it's so complicated these days. I, I have studied uh, from the 19th century and, and backwards, but these days, I mean, I do have a grasp of how it works, but it's very hard to say where we are going. But I can say this, that there are some, some signs that uh, there can be more trouble soon because <clears throat> you get all of these new doctrines like modern monetary theory, MMT, 
and this uh, it's kind of new speak going around that we need a new economy that works for everyone. Um, we need a you know a little bit like a people's economy. These are also uh, re recurring um, you know signs that when they when they mean that economic laws differ between continents or that economic laws differ, be differ between uh, time periods. I mean, the economy doesn't work like this. There's nothing new today. Uh, so, so when they think that there is something special today and they want to implement their crazy policies because of, it, because of this thought, that's dangerous. So we will see what happens with this, this MMT uh, people, if they're uh, shunned or if they're you know, embraced soon or not. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, to understand what's what's going to happen we we do live though in 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 totally uncharted territory so it's it's um what's what's now happening i think the, the, if we want to understand what is happening today where we have to look is, is china that's now experimenting with their cbdc right and you see um them sending out airplane money to millions of people all over the you know, all over the country. I think the reception has been so far that it hasn't worked really well. Uh, but the only reason is because they already have Alipay and other amazing systems of payments that are entirely digital. This is somewhat of a, of a you know, still early on prototype. But what, what's happening is, is the central banks totally bypassing the banks, right? Yeah. These, are, these, are, these are wallets that the government uh, the central bank is sending directly to the hands of the citizen, right? So the inflationary potential of this cannot be understated, right? So this is so in Germany, what you had was somewhat of a of, a, of an indirect line, right? You had you did ha you did have <clears throat> money going going to you know uh, to people for people could 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 receive it, but the majority of the money was going to to corporates. It was going to um, to corporate uh, industrial companies that would then employ people. Now it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure that's, I mean, this is still what's happening today, right? Out of the $1.7 trillion printed, uh, you know, for in QE in the States, I believe only, was it 300 million went in, it was, it was even less, uh, I, don't quote me, but it was like 10% or so that went uh, into, into, into support, into, uh, 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 unemployment benefits and so forth. So the majority is still going to corporates, but in a system such as this one, there's so much more like direct to com to consumer, um, which I think could lead to a system in which people millions are unemployed but still receiving support. And to add to this, um, I mean the, the the usual way money is issued these days. I think uh, Kevin, you and me and Stephanie talk about this. That the, the common way these days it's issued through debt. That means that when the money goes out to society, at the same time, a debt instrument is traded that's put on the balance sheet of the, the central bank. And that means that the system is constructed so that the, the debt is, uh, I mean, they, they have a re repayment plan. So the debt is coming back or the money is coming back to the central bank. And when it comes back to the central bank, it's actually burned. This is a very old tradition. They did it in the 18th century, 19th century also that sometimes they collected notes to burn it because otherwise you would just have this inflationary effect. But when they now, these days, send out money to consumers directly, I don't think there is a, a debt instrument that's backing it. I mean, there's yeah. no way for the money to go that's back I mean. to the central bank mm -hmm. to be burned. So this is uh, very dangerous because when it's stuck in the economy, it has no way to get burned. That's inflation. It's gonna, prices are gonna rise. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was my question then, you know, so what, what would happen? Uh, so, um, I mean, it's, it's a very scary thought, especially when you, when you know that you have a central bank digital currency that is as in, as in China with the whatever social credit system and uh, they're pushing it like hardcore, like what would that mean for the individual? You know, I mean, we'll talk, you know, uh, economy, alchemists, I mean, you, you are like deep into, you know, you've, you've written about censorship resistance and, and, uh, you know, decentralization and disintermediation and, uh, you know, it's about individual sovereignty. So the central bank would then know 
everything about the individual. Like, what have you bought even in a hundred years? Where have you bought it? Uh, they can they can just you know cut you off from from the from the money stream if you are not in favor of a you know some uh, political uh, you know if you don't if you're not supporting some kind of political opinion uh, that is uh, sort of how the official narrative. Uh, do, what's your position on that? I mean, is uh, is 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 Bitcoin the eventually thought of or or you know designed to be the 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 black market money for you know for for all of us eventually? When is going to be you know like a tipping point where people are going to reject you know uh, un, not only unethical, unconstitutional, but actually totally illegitimate laws and regulations? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it reminds me of the, the frog sitting in the pot of water as it starts to boil. And slowly but surely, uh, these laws and regulations encroach on our individual liberties and rights. And a couple generations go by and you have an entire population that's enslaved. It's hard, it's difficult not to speculate that the central bank digital currencies are simply going to be a tool to control their populations. As you mentioned, they would be able to shut off someone's livelihood at the flip of a switch. And, and I think that this is, it's really dangerous. And I do think we are at a very critical juncture um, where if we allow the collection of our personal information and allow this to get tied to a digital currency that is being issued directly from a central bank. Uh, that means that they can shut it off and take it back from us just as easily. And um, there's a guy on Twitter called Nixops, uh, N-I-X-O-P-S. He has a great saying. Um, he produces some really good content. Uh, his saying is, don't let Bitcoin become the greatest revolution that never happened. And I do think that this is a, a very critical juncture and it's part of the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm advocating for self-sovereignty and self-custody and keeping your KYC information out of Bitcoin. Uh, because if you can operate with your money privately and control your own keys, and interact with a network that is censorship resistant, then there's no central authority that's going to be able to stop you. But this freedom, this potential freedom that people have right now is constantly being threatened. And there's efforts to um, create these KYC mining pools and to control the Bitcoin right from the beginning. And, um, you know, I, I do foresee this turning into a split where there is a black market Bitcoin and uh, a clean Bitcoin market. Um, I don't think the black Bitcoin market is ever going to go away. I think miners will continue to process transactions that are, um, even if the address is on the OFAC list, um, but, you know, those are some of the proposals that they're trying to put into place is to create mining pools that um, will not process transactions, not because they don't meet consensus rules, but because uh, they don't agree with the person who or the entity who controls the private keys. So, yeah, I, I think the best thing people can do is, is to, to control their own keys, to self-custody their Bitcoin and to keep their personal information out of it. Yeah, and Giacomo Zucco, as you probably you all know, uh, just uh, recently tweeted something with with a reference to an article of Eric Vasquez. Uh, you probably know from Libitcoin, and uh, you know where Eric Vasquez sort of uh, describes in a pretty short article like the phases, like the honeymoon phase, the competition phase, and where eventually I don't know all the four, those four phases by name, but it's sort of where I understand it is that the government governmental mining pool would would censor. Uh, uh, transactions at a loss and so you'll have as you said you know the black market uh, we're harvesting you know those fees and then you have those yeah those sort of official like you know 
uh, artificially cleanse uh, uh, transactions, which yeah, which then are not going to go through if if it's somehow flagged or whatever or tainted, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, in my opinion, um, central banks have been fucking up the money for a very long time, and it's in everyone's best interest to take them out of the equation. Um, I think central banks should all be abolished. I don't. Yeah, think they they should have anything to do with Finally. our money. Yeah, and, you said um, it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because yeah, no. seriously, I mean they're above the law. I mean nobody's talking about this like big elephant in the room. There's, it's like a criminal entity above the law that can do anything with total criminal immunity, and nobody's asking questions. You know, I mean I have I didn't give my vote to them. You know, whether it's the fucking European Central Bank with the you know criminally convicted Lagarde. <laughs> You know, I mean, uh, it's 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 mind-boggling if you think about it, right? Yeah, the the fact that I can exchange my time and my livelihood for money to do the things in my life, and then they can they can debase that money, essentially stealing my time away from me, uh, is just absolutely maddening. It's it's a disgusting process, and you know, I. I think I really do think it's a form of enslavement. Yeah, totally. and yeah, um, I I I think Bitcoin is is a way for people to escape that stronghold and to interact with each other and their economies in a way that can't be stopped. Yeah. But what's beautiful about the situation, though, is is that it kind of doesn't matter what the central banks exist or not, it really doesn't matter because you can totally opt out. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like governments can do whatever they want. You can print as much money as you want. In fact, it's going to be better for me if as a bit as a Bitcoin holder. I don't, it, this is the thing, the, the beauty, the elegance of this entire um, uh, approach, right? Is that it's totally, it's a nonviolent protest in which you can continue. It's, uh, we're not about, we don't want, I don't necessarily care if central banks get abolished or not. I don't want to impose my violence on somebody else. But I have my own little kitty corner, and I'm going to live here, and you can do whatever you want to do. But I'm going to live in my own uh, in my own approach and, <laughs> and not have my money debased. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you guys think, uh, are we, 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 you know, we've been like talking like a few times now about this critical juncture. Uh, is it good that now, you know, on different levels, institutions, whatever, all these Michael Saylors and Paul Tudor Jones and the Druk Miller, whatever the name are, like, is it good that it's taking place? Is it taking place simultaneously? The adoption, the, you know, the funneling of capital, the, 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 the sort of the, 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 the conscious, you know, the, the awareness of, of people now, you know, like FOMOing in it. Is that good? Is that good? Quick, quick thought on that. I think uh, we're seeing that, but I think we're seeing that in the higher echelons of, of the financial markets. I think we've seen so many billionaires coming in. We've seen a lot of, you know, Bitcoin on, on CN, uh, on C, uh, some of the, the key financial uh, uh, kind of channels. You don't really see it yet in, in the main mainstream uh, newspapers so much. I think you're starting to see that for sure, but more in the financial arena of our world. I mean, one uh, good thing that more people just get into Bitcoin is they do become more interested in money. They, they read more about money and they, for the first time maybe in their lives, they start to think about what money is. Because uh, when before Bitcoin, there was only one, or there was no choice. You had the national money uh, unless you wanted to obtain something on the black market, essentially. So when there's only one choice, it doesn't make that much sense to spend too many hours thinking about it. I think the one thing about these institutions that are moving into the market that is disgusting is uh, companies offering services like PayPal, where they're taking the ideas of Bitcoin, the market hype of Bitcoin, the logos, the branding, they're, they're selling the ideas of Bitcoin to people. It's, it's decentralized, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's digital, but that's not what they're delivering. So PayPal is selling people the idea of Bitcoin, but they're not actually letting people use Bitcoin. And in fact, in, in their in their terms of service, they're encouraging people not to interact with Bitcoin 
uh, in a way that they're taking self-custody because it's too risky and it's too dangerous. And I, I think that, that that is frightening about the institutions moving into Bitcoin because I think the mass population at this critical juncture can get confused and believe that they are participating in the Bitcoin network when really they're just getting an IOU from PayPal. Yeah. And yeah. in that sense, I can see the Bitcoin, the greatest revolution that's never going to happen, completely getting sacked by the institutions and the regulators. And I, I think that would be more harmful. This is a very good point, actually, because people go for these centralized custodians because it's convenient right now. Um, the infrastructure, the scaling infrastructure, like Lightning Network, etc., it has uh, it's progressing, but it's difficult for some. It's less difficult for others. So as we are waiting for that to progress further, people are kind of uh, sent into these centralized institutions instead, and then, then we end up with a situation ac akin to how gold was previously. That of course many people have the physical gold at home, or uh, they yeah they own it themselves. But a large majority had IOUs. They had notes that were supposedly redeemable to gold. So it's important that people can take self-custody and that the infrastructure continues to progress. Um, we will see how that how that works and, and how quick all these new people are, are going to come into Bitcoin because as it is right now, the Bitcoin network is not fully ready for, uh, I mean, world adoption. Uh, it's still experimental. That's why you have this reckless uh, meme on, on that lightning network. I mean, when it comes to lightning, definitely, it's still, I mean, as I see it, you know, it's sort of in a developmental, you know, pretty risky phase. But I don't know, Nick, what, what would you say? I mean, uh, are, we, are we evolving now much faster? I mean, compared, of course, you know, to a couple of years or years ago, uh, you know, online, just just normal tra Bitcoin transaction. I mean, we've got like, so many wallets now, mobile wallets, uh, hardware wallets, uh, even full node, you know, to a certain degree, you need to still to have some kind of interest and, you know, patience to, you know, connect it and you need to take your time and educate yourself. Uh, do you see this as a, like, uh, as a something evolutionary right now? Or do you think it's going to take many, many years to come? Yeah, good question. Um, I think, well, I haven't been, I haven't taken notes over the, the 10, 13 years of, of well, well, so 12, 12, 13 years of Bitcoin's history, but I think the last four years have seen pretty, pretty massive uh, um, uh, well, technical improvements from all the new wallets coming in. And uh, in terms of Bitcoin's infrastructure uh, and, and, and the network per se, I, I don't think it's it's changed much necessarily. Um, and I, I think that's probably a good thing. Uh, I have spoken with some uh, and I'm not an engineer myself, so I'm not the best person to answer that perhaps, but uh, a lot of the engineers I've spoken to uh, who work uh, in, in Bitcoin have said that, I mean, the, you know, the system is, is incredibly sound and as the hash rate continues to grow, so is safety and security of the network. I think, although I do, I do agree with Emil that Bitcoin is still an experiment in many ways, we still haven't tested all the, all the, the dark um, challenges that we might face, especially if a government government really wanted to try to uh, to um, to take take it down, which I don't I don't think it's it's possible because of the decentralized nature. But uh, yeah, an energy based approach, possibly. Uh, I mean, I mean, I I don't know, right? But it is still experimental in the sense that we haven't faced all the challenges yet. That said, I think uh, it has proven itself to be a, a big player. And as soon as Bitcoin reaches the hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, it will start receiving a bit of a... I think this is where moving on to the question of what are Bitcoin's challenges and, and threats, uh, I think it goes back to our conversation about governments possibly banning it. And I, I don't buy that. I don't buy that because it's just... But, but I think there will be a very... Div multi-centered um, um, or varied approach by different governments uh, to, to Bitcoin. Like we saw yesterday, uh, the ECB said something about um, making, was it, yeah, was it, was it banning? Yeah, was it, did they say something about banning Bitcoin uh, actually? Yeah, so, so I think it's still something that, you know, we have to see and there will be different approaches. I think, I believe Bitcoin will, will, will stand <laughs> Most of them, but I mean, also, I don't know, right? I don't know. Um, 
Can, can I add a, a couple of things here? I, I think that Bitcoin is extremely solid when it comes to the, the, the base layer. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, what do we call it, the first layer. That has been battle tested for 12 years. And it's, it's just, that's not where the problem lies, in my opinion. The problem will be when millions and millions or hundreds of millions are going to onboard these uh, scaling solutions that are not uh, centralized. That will be really a, a trial because it will be adversarial uh, and um, the, it's, it's all open source software. It's, uh, in, in a sense, smart contracts on Bitcoin, this uh, lightning infrastructure. So they will, fight, they will be attacked and they, people will try to exploit them. And we have seen uh, what happened in some extreme cases in, in other chains. Uh, and not to compare Bitcoin with uh, all these altcoins, but let's take the second largest Ethereum. If you remember the bug, this critical bug they had in one of their um, so software implementations and hundreds of thousands of their tokens were suddenly stuck because they missed uh, a little, little thing. I mean, that can happen uh, if there's a lot of Bitcoins circulating in Lightning and then there's a bug somewhere in the most popular implementation. We can end up with a really scary situations there as well. So... <clears throat> Again, I think the base layer is very, very sound. I don't see any large chance that that will screw things up. I think the, the challenge is, is in the scale. Yeah. That's a great point. And I think it, it, it somewhat leads to the question, you know, what if a really, really deep and, and demanding implementation such as Taproot were to, were to come up, right? And a lot of people have on their Twitter handle, you know, Taproot 2020 and so forth. I mean, I, I've heard Taproot is, is a pretty deep, has some pretty deep demands, right? Um, how, how many people would want to risk the current Bitcoin infrastructure to implement a, 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 an anonymous, um, a more sort of, um, a, a more anonymous chain? I, I would certainly want that anonymous chain, but what we have so far is also pretty, is also pretty good, right? So. It's, it's, a, it's a tough one there. Yeah. And one optimistic thing, at least for me, is Bitcoin is, is in, a, in a sense attempting to be money, right? And money in a, an Austrian definition is the most liquid good uh, in the world. If, if Bitcoin is going to be global money, it's going to be the most liquid good uh, in the world. So that is, uh, that is kind of difficult. And that's when the scaling solutions have to work. But even if, this is a if scenario, even if Bitcoin fails at that, which is not to say that it will, but if, that means that Bitcoin can still have an incredible value. And this is a point that I like to make. Bitcoin competes with things that are not money. Also, it competes with uh, long-term debt instruments. It competes with uh, uh, gold. Uh, I know people say all the time that Bitcoin is digital gold and that some might be tired of this expression, but it doesn't make it any less true. true. It is true. Um, so, so this for me is a, a cause for optimism that Bitcoin can, I mean, have an incredible effect on the world, no matter what it will achieve in these two directions. Can I, you wanted to say something? Um, you want to add something? Oh, I was just, I was just going to say, you know, there's a lot of really smart people working on Bitcoin, uh, way smarter than myself. And, you know, if anything crazy did break because of whatever reason, it, I'm confident it would get patched very quickly. Worst case scenario, there's a hard fork. Um, I just, I don't ever see any sort of government being able to stop it or censor it or um, any amount of use and abuse being able to really damage it all that much. I, I think it's, it's here to stay. I think if the, you know, if the need arises, um, you know, I, I, I always have to think about what Jeff Fuse always says is about def, uh, exponential technologies. And, you know, the technologies we have right now where it's been evolving in the, in the last years or decades, it's like so exponential. It's, a, it's, a, it's deflationary by nature. So, uh, it's it's really well super super exciting times. I think if the if the need is there, uh, there you know as you said, there's like super uh, uh, you know uh, creative 
you know, super intelligent, ingenious people out there who's, who are going to develop, you know, the tools uh, and, and finally have, you know, the convenience and, and the, you know, the, the user friendliness and everything else uh, that, that is really required right now, you know, for, for every, you know, age group demographics we can, we can think of. And I think it's going to happen much faster than we can even imagine, you know, as we say, gradually and suddenly, I think that suddenly will really come uh, unexpectedly fast. That's what I see. So to wrap this up, do you, yeah. you guys have to any? Add to that, I think, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say to add to that, I think um, any downside risks to Bitcoin are a better option than the downside risks we face with centralized currencies. So uh, guys, I'm, I want to wrap this up. Um, do you guys have any final thoughts or um, do you, where do you see, do you want to like give off any final thoughts or, or um, um I don't know, ideas for the future or uh, do you see any structural changes coming up? Um, well, uh, oh yeah, go I'll ahead. Just, sorry, I'll just say, you know, if any of your viewers are not taking self-custody right now and they are interested um, and they're starting to see the benefits in that, check out Bitcoin Q&A. He's got a ton of great content. Um, and a lot of guides to help people get started up down that direction. So many others too. Yeah, Emil. Yeah. So what I can emphasize then before we quit this, um, I would say keep an eye on what's happening out in the economy, out in the world. Because right now we have this steady siphoning uh, through inflation. So the central banks sit in the middle like a parasite and they, as I think it was... Uh, either economist or make that said that they're, su they're sucking time from you. And, and it's, it's correct that they are like a parasite that sucks, um, that sucks time from you. And uh, where was it going with this? Uh, no, so, so keep an eye out on what's going on because what, what is really scary is when it stops being this small siphoning when, when there are real troubles in the world and they are done with the taxation um, when the national debt has increased too much so they can't really do more there. Some countries can actually, they can take more debt easily so they don't have to tinker with the money as much but some countries are already in so much debt so they will look at the, at the printing press system. So that, that's important for Bitcoins to understand as well that just because this past, let's say, 50 years have been uh, pretty peaceful uh, and uh, there's no tyrannical edicts coming from the government etc when things go bad they usually go to the money and make things worse and when things get worse the laws that come then if we are inferring from history are really tyrannical so yeah so let's self-custody is a very good advice um, yeah absolutely and and to echo the, that point and and go back to the I mean, the example I, I provided with, with Germany is, is very much very much that actually, right? That the printing press has often come in parallel with the, with the emergence of extreme political views. When people start get, going hungry, they will start blaming really anybody who can they who can blame. And uh, the, the German example is, 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 is ferocious uh, in, in terms of what happened, you know, in terms of the racial uh, hatred that arose because of people's desperation. Uh, the, 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 exam the example of the book are quite well done because uh, the, the, uh, the Jewish examples were uh, such that there were a lot of, uh, I mean, there were a lot of Jewish immigrants who, who never trusted the German mark right? It comes down to trust. A lot of the Germans trusted their governments, right? But the, the, the immigrants who had were also used to many different monetary systems and had an understanding of, of gold and where to store their value, put their wealth some, somewhere else. And that's what saved them. And that's what also got them burnt after. And, and, and that's what ha had, that's why people went after them. And so, yeah, tr don't, don't trust, I think, <laughs> don't trust governments. Uh, and, 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 and look into money, uh, trust yourself, trust numbers with, with your money, self-custody, absolutely. And, um, and yeah, be careful because the next 10 years uh, are going to be uh, pretty turbulent if, if, if it is true that what we've been talking about um, 
the directions between money and politics um, lead to lead to extreme extreme positions. That was awesome. I really enjoyed this talk. I, uh, you know, always learn a lot. Maybe we can continue this talk next time. Uh, you know, either with with uh, three with the four of us, or maybe even together with um, Stefanie von Jan. Or uh, I really enjoyed this. Uh, do you have any uh, like where, where can people find you? Let's start off with Economa uh, Alchemist. <clears throat> I'm pretty active on Twitter. My handle is Econo Alchemist. Uh, I also have a blog at econoalchemist.com. Right. So I, I'm. Uh, you can find me on MetaMic 14, and uh, and yeah, you. I have uh, a website, but um, mostly blogs on on on, on Medium and uh, and so forth. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter as well. I write about uh, monetary history and Bitcoin mostly. Uh, it's the app Besant Denier, or just uh, search for Emin Sunset. Uh, I also have a web page, uh, bdratings.org, um, where which I will update in a while now as I release the second book. Um, so, all right, cool. Well, hopefully we can continue this talk. Really enjoyed this. Thank you so much, guys, for your time and for sharing your knowledge. And have a good time. All right, take care. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers. How did you enjoy this? I really had a blast. I really enjoyed this talk. It's always, you know, fascinating to talk to Emil. And now for the first time, I had Mick and Connor Alchemist on my show. It was really down the rabbit hole. It, it, uh, you know, the, it's always important to reiterate those questions and understand, question everything around us and. And, and, and really, you know, have a interconnected comprehension, uh, the root causes, and eventually, you know, don't trust the government, don't trust the central bank, just trust yourself, because, uh, you know, uh, we are, ha you know, it's, uh, these are criminal entities, and beyond any imagination, beyond any description, so um, I hope you enjoyed this, let me know if you have any questions, and please make sure that you follow, make Econo Alchemist and Emil Sunstead on Twitter. I'm going to put their links on the show notes. And if you want to support me, please write a five star, you know, positive review if you really love this show on iTunes or any podcast platform. My email address is hello at the totalconnect.com. If you want to donate or, you know, support me or us in our film project, Humanity Rooted in Bitcoin, we're also, you know, working on a Bitcoin commercial, a teaser trailer, and a full documentary production. So, I really had a blast. Hope you had that too. My name is Kevin Davani and I'll see you soon again. Thank you so much again. Bye.